Thank you, guys. <clears throat> that was beautiful, wasn't it? Let's, uh, let's open with a little word of prayer, and we're going to get right into it today. Father, this morning we invite you to be here with us as we open your word once again, and, and as we seek to understand you better and in turn understand ourselves better, I ask that you would send your spirit to fill each and every one here, uh, that they would hear your voice, and they would not just hear with their ears, but they would hear with their hearts, and that they would accept what you have for them today. We pray in your name. Amen. All right, today we're going to attempt to cover the longest chapter in the book of John. John chapter 6 is actually 71 verses, but I promise you uh, we're not going to talk about every single verse. Don't, don't, don't get too worried. Uh, John chapter 6, is, it's fascinating, like every other chapter is actually only about one thing. One thing, one major truth. I've divided it up into three parts. Verses 1 through 15 is about distributing the bread of the boy. Verses 16 to 21, the storm on the sea. And then, by the way, actually, that, that, that section there in the middle, uh, we're going to talk about this in a moment, but it was actually not necessary except for the actions of the disciples. Uh, we'll see that in a moment. And the last section, verses 22 through 71, is about distributing the bread of life. Um, so we really go from distributing the bread of the boy to distributing the bread of life. And there are some powerful parallels there, you know, between what takes place uh, of the feeding of the 5,000 and what takes place in Jesus' discourse about the bread of life, which, by the way, is him. He is the bread of life. Uh, and if you don't know this, this about me already, I love to get right to the point. And I, that's why I love the book of John so much, because John, uh, you know, in his book, he doesn't beat around the bush. John gets right to the point. He gets right to the heart of the matter. And the point in relation to the book of John, the point is Jesus. And John, he, he gets right to the heart of it. He gets right to the point. We notice that in the ver very first chapter, verse 36, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Let's dive right into chapter 6 together this morning. We're going to begin in verse, verse 1. Uh, After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now, I want you to notice here, there are no discourses here. There's no long teaching. There's no parables. Even in, in the book of John, there's not even the Lord's Prayer. The book of John is all about action. Right? Jesus in the book, it's all about action. He, he, it's all about watch the way that I treat people and, and watch, uh, you know, what I do in that situation. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes we get too much head knowledge and we don't get enough action. We don't get enough action. Heart knowledge, real life experience. You know, life, life is practical. Life, life is real. And when Jesus came to this earth, he came to be real and he came to be practical. So he sits up on the mountain with his disciples and he doesn't give any discourses. He, 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 but, you know, what we know from the other gospels tells us that at this point he'd been preaching for many hours. He'd been preaching. Uh, so much so that the, the people start to get hungry. Verse 4, we're going to pick it back up. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. God knows what he's going to do. Amen? And he's wondering, he's wondering if we are so connected to him, so connected with him, we're so focused on him, we're so intertwined with him, he's wondering if we also know what he's going to do. Or are we trusting what he can do? Was Philip that connected? Verse 7. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for anybody to even get a little bit. There's not enough bread, Jesus. There is no way that we can feed this multitude of people. Jesus, there's, it's, he's doing the math in his head. It's just not possible. It's not possible. Where is Philip looking? Philip is looking to the earth. He's looking to the, the, the temporal things. He's looking to the, the possibilities that are limited by us, by our humanity. Where are you looking today? 
Where have you been looking in your life and, and in your walk with Jesus? What are, what are the dreams? What are the visions? What are the things that God has for you? And where are you looking? Are you looking to see those fulfilled in yourself? Or maybe in your circumstances? Are you depending on the people around you? Or are you looking to Jesus? And beholding him. Verse 8, we're going to pick it back up. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Now, how did he know that? How did he know? Have you ever wondered that before? How did Peter know that there was a boy there that had some food that brought a lunch along? Well, I, I think that Peter and the other disciples, they were wondering, they were getting a little hungry. It's getting towards lunchtime, right? And they're like, man, what are we going to eat? <laughs> what are we going to eat? They're, they're scoping out the situation, right? They're, they're looking through the multitude, and they come across a boy. And they, they were like, you know, we, we, can, we can get you a personal interview with Jesus, <laughs> right? Right? Right about lunchtime, you stick with us. Come, come with us. There's a boy here. He's got some food. It's probably not going to satisfy all those people. They knew that. But there's probably enough for us. There's probably enough for us. He has five barley loaves and two fishes, uh, but what are they for so many? Verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. And right there, the disciples already are amazed. Because those are not the words that they expected Jesus to say. What they thought Jesus was going to say was, make the people go home. It's time to eat. There's not a lot of food here. There's just enough for us. That's what they thought he was going to say. That's what they wanted him to say. Make the people go home, and we're going to have a little picnic. We're going to have a little feast for ourselves right here. Have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Now, imagine that I had five loaves of bread up here. And two fish, uh, two, two small fish, by the way, it, it illustrates that point. And this place is, is so packed, there's not enough seats. People are standing in the aisles, out in the foyer. Uh, maybe there's people watching on a screen next door. And that doesn't even come close to these numbers, by the way. But just imagine that. And imagine I said, you know, I made a little now. We're going to have lunch, right? We've been, we've been together. It's getting towards lunch. We're going to have lunch. There's five loaves of bread. There's two fish. We're just going to get in a nice little line. You know, no pushing, no shoving. Don't, don't get up and run now. We're just going to file out nicely and politely. And it's, it's just first come, first serve. Do you think there'll be enough for all of us? This is the, the situation the disciples are looking at, but exponentially worse. 5,000, and that's just the men. That's not including women and children. There's a lot, a lot of people there. A lot of people. And Jesus makes them sit down. Jesus tells them to sit down. The, the disciples at this point, they're, they're kind of beside themselves. They're a little nervous, right? What is going, what, what is he going to do? What, I mean, we can't. Uh, there's going to be a riot on our hands. And Jesus here, he stepped up to the plate. Verse 11. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. So when Jesus broke the bread, that bread, when that bread was broken, he began to share, he began to distribute it to his disciples. He gave to his disciples, and after the disciples, they went out and they began to distribute it among the people. And when they got to the different groups of people that were sitting in the grass, they said, take as much as you want. Take as much as you want. Do you need some more? You look really hungry. Take as much as you need. Take all you want. Take all you need. Verse 12. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. We can go here right back to John chapter 1 and we can say, as Jesus did, basically, you think that's something? That I could feed 5,000 people plus? 
You, you think that's amazing? You haven't seen anything yet. You haven't seen anything. This, this really was not the point of Jesus' miracle here. To amaze the people, to show that he was the prophet, that he was of God. But the onlookers, they, they took this manifestation of, of temporal blessing and they decided that they were going to use this to make Jesus king. They were going to force him to become their king. He can heal the sick. He can raise the dead. He can feed armies. He can conquer the world. And so this next section, it's kind of an interlude, if you will. I don't believe that it was intended to be this way. And the progression of thoughts is taking place in John chapter 6, verse 15. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Now, something takes place within that sentence that is not actually described here in this verse. But basically what is going on, what's happening here, is that Jesus perceives they're going to force him to become king. They're going to take him and make him king. Uh, and so he dismisses his disciples. He dismisses the multitude. And he does not dismiss them because they're hungry and they don't have enough food. He dismisses them because they're about to force them to become king. He wants to feed them. He wants to take care of their temporal needs. He wants to take care of our temporal needs. Amen? But when it comes to forcing something upon Jesus that is not in a harmony with the will of God, you're crossing the line. And Jesus says, no. No. I've not come to be king. I've come to be a servant. I've, I've not come to rule by force. I've come to rule by love. No. And then he goes into a mountain alone. And I believe this is very significant here. This is very significant. Because what has happened is Jesus ha has set up for a perfect revelation of truth. Jesus was, was, was doing this miracle to, to bring out something about himself concerning the fact that he is the bread of life. Let's just summarize it quickly. First of all, there isn't enough bread to feed everyone. In other words, in a spiritual sense, the disciples are saying... Uh, uh, the bread of life, the bread of eternal salvation is limited. There isn't enough for everyone. We need to send some away because there's barely enough for us. Salvation is limited to us, to the elite, to the ones that are closest to you. Those of us who are disciples, there are some who just aren't going to make it. And we need to focus on the ones who are going to make it. And the ones uh, that should be fed, that, that need to be fed. Jesus tells the people to sit down. Because when Jesus works, he's not asking us to do it. He's asking us to receive what he's going to do. Sit down, Jesus says. And, and when you sit down, by the way, you can't do a lot. Can you? When you sit down, in a sense, you're incapacitated. And Jesus, he wants to remind us that there is something he wants to give us for which we cannot work. Something we cannot earn ourselves. Sit down, Jesus says. I'm going to feed you by the miracle working power of the love of God. And God is going to reveal to them that he has plenty of bread for everyone. He has plenty of bread for everyone, for anyone who is hungry. There's plenty of bread. There's plenty of salvation, grace to feed the hunger of all. So Jesus, he breaks the bread. The bread is Jesus. And now remember, this miracle is preparing for what's coming in verses 22 through 71. It's been interrupted by the will of man. It's been interrupted by the will of man. Satan has inspired these people to force Jesus to do something that was never God's will. And so uh, an interruption takes place and Jesus has gone alone to a mountaintop to reconnect with God in a very close and significant way so that he can figure out what he's going to do next. He can't take his disciples with him, by the way, because they've all influenced him in a negative way. He's got to go alone to God. You know, there are times, friends, when there's no human being there's no person that can really help us and give us the direction that we need in life. We can only get that when we go alone to God. The pastor sometimes can help. 
counselor sometimes can help. Friends can sometimes help. But there are times when there's no human voice that can give us the direction that God alone wants to give us in life. We need to go alone to God. Human voices many times influence us to go in the wrong direction. They are thinking temporal. They are thinking earthly. They're not thinking spiritual. They are not connecting with God's will for us. Nobody can know your will for you but God alone. Other people, they can, they can help us, but ultimately that is between you and God. Now, I'm not even talking about husband and wife at this point. You know, the wife can go to the husband, the husband can go to the wife, but ultimately we all need to go to God. And God, Jesus is saying, what do I do now? What do I do now? Because I have this powerful sermon prepared. I wanted to deliver something that's going to really impact them in the context of this illustration, the feeding of the 5,000. What do I do now? It's been interrupted by the will of man. Jesus, the bread of life, was broken. You know, we, we don't think that Jesus will be enough. We don't think that Jesus is more than enough to satisfy the hunger of the multitudes of humanity. To gather the broken pieces, by the way, is to gather every ray of self-sacrificing love that Jesus provided to satisfy the hunger of humanity. In other words, as we minister, as we share, as we do evangelism, as we meet with people who are caught up in the secular world, sometimes we're tempted to meet with them with the things of the world. To try to use the world to preach the gospel. Because we're in doubt. We're not sure that Jesus is enough. But Jesus says that he can satisfy us, plus have plenty to spare. He can fill us and there will be joy left over. And that's good because we not only want joy for us, but we want joy left over because we want to share that joy with others. Amen? And we're, we're so afraid there's not going to be enough for us, and we don't realize that God has so much that it's going to overflow. He wants to satisfy our deepest needs, our deepest hungering, and then he wants us to take that experience that we have, that thing that we've done, and he wants us to go and share it and give it to others. But many times we don't think that we have anything to give. Many times we're right, by the way. Because we've been looking at the things of this earth. In this story, 12 baskets are left over. That's one, by the way, for every one of the disciples. Jesus had broken himself, in a sense, into fragments in this feeding of the multitude. He had broken himself into fragments, meal sized portions that were to be gathered up and given to hungering humanity. And then the disciples were to gather up the fragments of those portions. Why? Because nothing was to be wasted. Now, there were more who needed to be fed, so I have to ask, how's your basket? How's your stomach? Are you satisfied with the bread of life? Do you have baskets left over to share with others? You know, the more that we eat, the more we have to share. The more we eat, the more we have to... You notice that as you focus on Jesus, behold the Lamb of God, and you get into the Word, that, that, that is what begins to come out of you. And what we spend time beholding, that's what we spend time talking about. So those men came to take him by force, not recognizing that he came for self-sacrifice. They wanted to make him king, and he came as a servant. They called him a prophet, but he was the Messiah, much more than a prophet. So Jesus tells his disciples to go to the other side. Verse 16, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. They were trying to force their will upon the Messiah, upon Jesus Christ. So they went down to the sea, they got into a boat, it was dark, Jesus was not with them. Verse 18, the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, about halfway across the sea, the, the, there they, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. Have you ever been afraid of Jesus? 
It's, you know, here it's not really that they're afraid of Jesus. It's that they're in a, a situation, they're in a, this trial, and in the context of this trial, the darkness and the waves are roaring. And in that context, when they see Jesus, they're afraid. They're afraid. You know, many times our trials make us afraid of Jesus. They cause us to fear Jesus. And a lot of these trials, by the way, are man-made. This was a man-made trial. This was their thing. You know, I don't ever think it was God's will that these verses here in the middle of John 6 be there. This was man's will. They were trying to force their will on Jesus. This was an interruption to God's plan. You know, there are trials in our lives that are interruptions to the plans that God has for us. God never intended them to be a part of our life. They bring scars and experiences that are troubling to us. You know, sometimes we can grow through those experiences, praise the Lord. But these trials, many times, they cause us to be afraid of God or to fear God. To think that He's coming to do harm to us. No, but in fact, Jesus here, He's coming to rescue them. He was coming to rescue them. They saw him and they were afraid. Verse 20, but he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. I love that. It's me. Hey guys, it's me, Jesus, your friend. Don't be afraid. Right? So what happens then? When Jesus reveals himself to us in our storms and our trials, when he comes to us to rescue us, when the waves are seeking to, to capsize our little boat that we're in, when he comes to us and reveals himself to us, notice what it says in verse 21. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was to the land to which they were going. When Jesus is revealed, the will melts. When Jesus comes to us, the will surrenders. You know, by the way, that's the only way, that is the only way that the will surrenders. We cannot surrender our wills except that Jesus is revealed to us as he really is. In all of his beauty, in all of his grace, in all of his love. As Jesus revealed himself to us in the midst of those trials, in the midst of those struggles, as he reveals himself to us, the will surrenders. And they willingly, gladly received him into the boat. Come on in. Come on in. Now, at this point, something takes place that to me is really significant. And, and uh, sometimes uh, I think people read this and they just skip right over this. But I don't know how this happens, by the way. I have no idea. But it says there, it says there, immediately the boat was on the other side. What? 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 I mean, that, that sounds like it's at the, like the speed of light or something. Like, how did that happen? Immediately, the boat on the other side. What, what, what was it like to be in a speedboat 2,000 years ago? I mean, immediately, they're in the middle of the lake. He steps in, and they're on the other side. Now, Jesus here, I think, performs another miracle, one that sometimes we miss in this reading. He again manifests his divine power. He's fed the 5,000. He, he's walked on the water. And now he's taken the boat immediately to the other side of the lake. Just right away. And we're talking about several miles here in, in a split second. Verse 22. Let's pick it back up here. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there. And that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples. But that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? So they, they, they go and, just see, and they see the disciples. They, they see them get in the boat without Jesus. Go to the other side of the lake. Then they see that Jesus is not on that side anymore. That he's not on this side anymore of the lake. But there's no other boats that have gone over there. So they get in boats and they go over there. Right? And they get to the other side. They see the disciples are there. And they see the boat that the disciples got on is there. And then there's their boat. They just took over uh, themselves. And they're like, how did Jesus get here? 
How did he get over here? How, how did you get here? I think it's interesting how Jesus responds when you look at this. Verse 26, he says, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Jesus is saying, you're seeking me out of selfish motives. Period. That's it. Jesus does this over and over in the book of John. Jesus just gets to the point. Nicodemus says, you're a teacher sent from God. And Jesus says, except that you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. How did you get over here, Rabbi? The reason you came here looking for me is because I fed you all that bread. Now, in a sense, Jesus wants to remind them, I think, of what had taken place because he wasn't finished with his spiritual lesson uh, on the other side of the lake. It had been interrupted. It wasn't about feeding you with the bread. That wasn't the point of what I did. It wasn't about that. Uh, the point of what I did is about to fall. I, I want to share you, with you the point of what I did, Jesus is saying here. Now, first of all, I want you to know, I want you to know that all of you are seeking me out of selfish motives. That's why, uh, friends, we're here at church. That's why we follow Jesus in any way, shape, or form. It's all completely and utterly selfish. That's what Jesus says. We are bankrupt of righteousness. There is no one that seeks after God. No, not one. We've all turned our own way, and we desperately need the righteousness of Christ. There may be some that struggle with this idea. You know, Pastor, I've been in Adventist for three or four generations. I'm definitely better than most of the people I see, even in church. I don't do the things I see them doing. But the fact of the matter is, friends, that unless you can come to understand that reality, that there is nothing that Jesus can do for you. You are completely lost and at the same time completely deceived. And that is the problem of Laodicea. They are not willing to admit that they are blind and miserable and naked and wretched. They don't want to admit it. And the only remedy for that is what Jesus is about to say right here. He's, he's getting right to the point, right to the heart of it. I want to tell you something that's very important. Jesus is saying you are selfish to the core. But they don't get it. They don't get it. Jesus continues, verse 27, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on Him God the Father has set His seal. Now I like this because there's, there's, there's kind of a contradiction here. Jesus is now making the transition. He, he's saying, you sought me for the temporal, right? I fed you, and that's why you're coming after me, because you're selfish and you want to be fed again, Right? You're seeking me for that. But he, he said, I want to give you the eternal. I, I'm not, I don't want to give you just the temporal. I, I do that because I love you, but I want to give you the eternal. You want the temporal bread, but I want to give you the eternal bread. Now, this is the reason why I did that whole thing, Jesus is saying here. I, I was to get you to the spiritual point. You work for the temporal bread, but I want you to work for the eternal life that I'll give you. Now, do you see the contradiction there? What's, what's, what's he saying there? He, he, I want you to work for the eternal life that I'm going to give you as a gift. What? I want you to work for the gift. How can you work for a gift? If, some, if something is a gift, how can you work for that? I, wanna, I want you to work for the thing I'm going to give you. Jesus is going to answer his own question here. He's going to explain it. Verse 28, then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God. This is the thing he was just talking about. I want you to work for the eternal bread. That you believe in him whom he has sent. In other words, sit down. That's your labor. Sit down. Isn't that what Jesus told the multitude? Have them sit down. Now, if there were people there that didn't want to sit down, Right? Maybe there were people there that were nervous about these five loaves and two fish. There wasn't going to be enough to feed everyone. Maybe there were some men there that just got a little nervous, a little scared, a little anxious about that. And they were just standing there. And they're like, I don't know, Jesus, you know, I, I heard you, but don't worry about us. We'll go to the nearest town and we'll make do for ourselves. 
Don't worry about us. We're good. That's our natural inclination as men, isn't it? We're going to take care of ourselves. We're going to take care of ourselves. We're going to make sure that we labor for the things that we need. But Jesus says, no, I want you to sit down. Sit down. That's your labor. There is labor involved. There is belief involved. There is something we need to do. Uh, there is the work of God. By the way, we are not saved by our works. We are saved by grace. Amen? But we are judged by our works. We're judged by our works, the Bible says. And the first thing that, that I believe is going to come up in the judgment is this one right here. Have you believed in the Son of God? Have you believed in the Son of God? That was the first word that came up when the, the thief on the cross came into judgment. Right? You know he came into judgment, right? You know, Jesus, you know, he, he told him, you know, you're going to be with me in the kingdom of God. Uh, you know, why? Because the work that he gave us was to believe in the Son of God. That's where we all start. Sit down and believe. Believe in what God is about to do for you. Believe he's going to feed you. Believe God's going to feed you. Do you believe that? Sometimes we get up in the morning and we don't believe that. We think, I really have to provide for my family. You know, there's some appointments I've got to make. There's some impressing things I've got to do. And there's some, you know, in fact, life is so busy. You know, Martin Luther said, I've got so many things to do that there's no way I'll ever be able to accomplish them all unless I spend five hours in prayer. But we don't believe that. We don't believe that we need to sit. We need to sit. That's one of the themes that we're going to see in the book of John. When Mary is portrayed in the book of John over and over and over again, where is she? She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. John chapter 8, she's at Jesus' feet. Then Jesus comes to Bethany, and he's there with Martha and Lazarus. And where is Mary? She is at Jesus' feet, sitting there. And then he's in Simon's house, and he's having a feast. And where is Mary? Anointing his feet. And then he's hanging up on the cross. And all the disciples have deserted him. And who is standing at, the, at his feet at the cross? Mary. And then at the tomb, Jesus manifests himself as the gardener. But when Mary recognizes his voice, what does she do? She throws herself at his feet. Just time and time and time again throughout the book of John. Do you know that Mary was the first person to proclaim the gospel? All the disciples, Peter, John, all these guys, they're locked up in a room. And Mary is running around crazy. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen. Why do you think that is? Because she sat at Jesus' feet. She was there at Jesus' feet. That's where God is calling us every moment of every day. He wants us to be at his feet. This is the work. That is the work. The work is to sit down and get the bread. Just take the bread. Just believe that there's bread for you. We think there's no way, there's no way that there's more bread. There, friends, there's so much bread, there's enough to feed everyone. And God just wants to open it up, he wants to pour it out, so we won't even be able to hold all of it. You know, the book of Malachi says, I'll open up the winds of heaven, and you won't even be able to hold it all. That means, by the way, we're going to have to share it. Amen? Continuing on here, verse 30, so they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? And Jesus is like, well, what? You mean like the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on the water and bringing the boat to the other side of the at lightning? Those aren't signs? They're not really asking for their sign, by the way. They're just manifesting their unbelief. They're just not really interested in the deep things of God. They're not really interested. You know, they, they just want to see miracles. They just want to see outward things. They, they don't want to get into the nitty-gritty. You know, this, this work that God has called us to do, this labor that God has called us to do, to sit at the feet of Jesus, that's intense. That's, that, that, that's intense. Have you tried it? To sit at the feet of Jesus on a consistent basis, day by day, week by week, month by month? 
Verse 31. Our fathers ate the man in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now Jesus is back on track, amen? He has spent the evening with his Father, and God has given him guidance, and this is what you need to do. This is what you need to say. And Jesus didn't say or do anything, by the way, that was not, uh, you know, God had not guided him to do. And so Jesus here, he's back on track. He's directing the minds of his hearers to the true point of all of that bread. Guess what? It's all about me. It's all about me. You didn't think there was enough? You know, there is enough of me with plenty to spare. That bread is just a symbol, by the way. It's just a representation of what my father and I have always wanted to do. It's a representation. So Jesus says to them, uh, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. For what? Well, he's talking about spiritual bread here. He's talking about the thirst and the hunger that we have on, on the level that is, that is outside of the temporal. It's outside of the temporal, and we do have that. Every single one of us has that. We have that hungering, that thirsting, that craving for more than just the temporal things. And the world and Satan, they try to supply those things to us, but Jesus says, if you come to me, you're not going to hunger for those things. You're not going to thirst for those things. I can actually satisfy you. I'm a little bit unbelieving when it comes to that. I believe, but I want God to help my unbelief. Because there are some things in this world I really enjoy. Anybody else? There's things you enjoy? Let's be honest here. Have you ever asked the question, I wonder if that'll be in heaven? Right? Sometimes you wonder. And Jesus is saying, I, I don't want you ever to wonder about it. I want to assure you I want to assure you that I can satisfy every single hunger and every single thirst that you have. All the way to the deepest level. The people missed this, by the way. They didn't get it. Over and over again, they misunderstood the point that Jesus was trying to make. Jesus is better than temporal blessings. Jesus is all that we need. And he has already been given to all people. Now this is the emphasis that we're going to see here as we move into these following verses. Verse 36. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? You know, friends, if you just had that one promise alone, that would be enough to take you into the kingdom of heaven. That's all you need right there. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now, it's really important for us to know that the will of the Father, what the will of the Father is. Because that's the thing that Jesus Christ came to do. Especially as we relate to salvation. Verse 39. And this is the will of him who sent me. That I should lose how much? Zip, zero, zilch, nada, nothing. That I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. See, that's what the bread thing was all about. Gather up the fragments so what? Nothing be lost. God doesn't want anything to be lost. This is the point he's making here. I don't want anything to be lost. That's the Father's will, by the way. I'm just coming to do the Father's will. That's what God wants. I kind of like the idea, by the way. In fact, I'm in love with this whole concept that what Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying here, he's like, I am so, in fact, I'm so sold out that I'm not willing to be king. I'm not willing to be crowned. I'm not willing to be exalted in any way. That's why when I heal people, I disappear. That's why when I do miracles, I don't want to be found. I just don't want any of that because I'm so caught up. I'm so focused on doing God's will, and I don't want that to be hindered that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. And just in case we missed it, verse 40, 
This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. This is the will of God. Praise God. There is not one single person on planet Earth, including every single person here today, that God does not want. You are wanted. You're wanted. And there's a price on your head, amen? You are wanted. So how do the Jews respond to this incredible proclamation of God's love? Can it, I mean, can it really ever get more sublime than this? This eternal, everlasting, unending, unrelenting pursuit of every fragment being broken for the entire world. How do the Jews respond to that? How do they respond? Verse 41. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Wow. Wow. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that Jesus can pour out his heart? He can pour out his heart and he can talk about the love that God has for the human race, not wanting anyone to be lost. And the religious leaders, the religious people, the Seventh-day Adventists of Jesus' time say, did you hear him right? Did he say he was the bread that came down from heaven? Wasn't, wasn't that Moses' thing? Like, is that what he's saying? And they missed the entire point. They're concerned about the facts rather than about the truth, the way, and the life. I mean, I, I th think about this, because when we think about the love of God, we need to think about it in the sense that God's will is that Jesus should lose nothing. That's God's will. And that really means something, but to the Jews, it meant nothing. With this in mind, the whole miracle that Jesus performed in the first part of the chapter makes sense. Here's how it works. God has enough food for everyone and to spare. God wants to gather the fragments, the broken pieces and people, so that none is lost. God does not leave us to perish in the storms of life. God can get us safely to the other side of our storms. God knows he can change our selfish motives. God does not save us by our works, but by our belief and his works. And God is not willing that anything be lost and that no one should perish. That's basically what Jesus has said to the Jews. And their response is, hmm, did he say he was the bread that came down from heaven? Because I'm not sure about that. I mean, there, are there any Bible verses on that? Can, can he prove that? Where, where is that written down? That he is the bread that came down from heaven. And I think it's the most remarkable and, and really diabolical fact that Satan, pay attention to this, friends, Satan wants us to get so caught up in the intellectual facts about Jesus. Did he live in Nazareth? Don't we know his parents? So caught up that we miss the heart of God. The heart of Jesus has been just fully exposed. The heart of God has just been fully exposed. His undying, relentless love for us seeks to explode upon our minds, threatening to destroy the hardened human heart. And the response of God's professed people is, hmm. And they're murmuring, they're grumbling, which means they're kind of talking under their breath so Jesus can't really hear what they're saying. Did he really just say what I thought he said? You know, the Bible, by the way, puts murmuring in the same category as worshiping idols. How do you know when your religion is cold formalism or base hypocrisy? When the facts about Jesus are more important than the love of Jesus. When the facts about Jesus are more important than the love of Jesus, that's when you know that your religious experience has become cold formalism or just basic hypocrisy. We know Jesus. We know his father. We know his mother. Jesus is one of us. He has earthly parents. He came from the ghetto of Nazareth. He lived and worked in the carpentry shop. Make no mistake, friends. Knowing only that Jesus was a man who had a father and a mother is not far away from knowing nothing about Jesus whatsoever. The point of John's entire gospel is to know that Jesus is God. 
Jesus is God. This is the focus that John has, his emphasis. This is why John spends so little time on what Christ taught and more time on what Christ did and who he claimed to be. He was God's voice made audible. He was God's thoughts in action. He was God's heart made vulnerable. Vulnerable. Because to know that Jesus was God makes his becoming a man everything. So that's why Jesus had to convince them, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. I'm the one. I am God in human flesh. That's what makes it everything. So when we see Jesus, we see God. Amen? And when we see God, we see one who wants nothing to be lost. God longs to save the broken, the fragmented, all of those who were once formed in the image of God from what we have become. He wants every fallen human being. He wants us all. Every single one. How do you know when your religious experience is at the point of rejecting Christ? When you think you know all about Jesus, but do not care to know about his love. You know the paternal love of the Father was Jesus' favorite theme? The paternal love of the Father was Jesus' favorite theme. So they begin to murmur, they begin to complain, and Jesus then, Jesus then emphasizes that no one comes to the Father unless they are drawn. And Jesus says, they will be raised in the last day. Now God's will, God, God wills that everyone be saved, and he draws everyone, it says, so that those who are drawn are going to be raised. Well, this raises a question then, will everyone then be saved? No. No. Now, we could spend a lot of time on this, and it could even be argued from a purely human perspective that only the saved are, are raised up by Jesus. But we know John 5 teaches us that everyone is going to be raised up by Jesus. Now, the devil, he wants to come in, he wants to say, well, Jesus raised the righteous, but I actually raised you guys. You guys are with me, I raised you. But that, that's not true, is it? Jesus says, everyone will hear my voice, and some will be raised to the resurrection of life, and some will be raised to the resurrection of condemnation. Right? Why does Jesus resurrect the lost? Why does he do that? There are several reasons, but one reason I really want to focus on right now is this. It's that because the plan of salvation included them. The plan of salvation included them. There is no such thing as an election. Some are elected to be saved, and some are elected to be lost. Some are predestined to be saved, some are predestined to be lost. No. God has predestined everyone to be saved. Amen? And the resurrection proves that. The reason why Jesus resurrects them, among other reasons, is to show them that you were part of the plan of salvation. It was my will that you be saved. It was my will that you be justified. And you had justification of life. It was my will that you be sanctified. And there were things that you did that revealed sanctified works. There is nothing good, by the way, that any human being ever does on the face of this earth that is not done through the influence and the power of God. So even the, the rough biker who stops in the road to let the little kids cross, he is being impressed by the Spirit of God to do that. Any good deed, any nice deed that we do comes through the influence of the Spirit of God. Justified, sanctified, even glorified, even resurrection. The Great Controversy, page 544, says this. In consequence of Adam's sin, death passed upon the whole human race. All alike go down to the grave, and through the provisions of the what? The plan of salvation, all are to be brought forth from their graves. The point that Jesus is trying to make here in John chapter 6 is this. I have enough for all of you. I provided for all of you. There's no election. There's no select few. Don't think that the bread isn't enough. There is plenty. Unfortunately, the resurrection of those who reject God's love, it's temporary. It's incomplete. And they erase their former physical state, which is the true night of the living dead, in the final ex executive judgment. So two points to remember as we're drawing this thing to a close here. God draws all people to himself. Amen? God draws all people to himself. And we will say this more when we look at John chapter 12, by the way. And number two, God, not Satan, raises all who are drawn. All who are drawn. Even those who end up resisting God's love and eventually perish. God draws all. Jesus confirms this truth of God's love for all people 
But at the same time, it's interesting, he quotes from the Old Testament, showing that the gospel of God's love is not just a New Testament idea, but it's the everlasting gospel. Verse 45, this is what he says. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has head and, and learned from the Father comes to me. Everyone is taught. Everyone is drawn. And if you listen and you learn, you respond to the drawing, you come. So God instructs all people, but not all people listen. Not all people learn from God's instruction. And those who do not listen, those who do not learn, do not come to Jesus. Verse 46, not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Only Jesus has seen, perceived, or attended to the Father. That's what that word seen there in the Greek means. Seen, perceived, or attended to. You know, this last meaning, to attend to, it helps us to understand what Jesus is really saying here. A lot of people have seen the Father. Well, we, we could say we haven't seen the Father, we've only seen the Son, because that's the one that manifests himself. But if you've seen the Son, the Bible says you've seen the Father, Right? But no one has attended to, or no one has really perceived the Father. That's what that Greek word is really getting at there. To see Him is one thing. To see Him is one thing. But to perceive or attend to Him is completely different. Only Jesus, only Jesus has attended to the Father. That is, only Jesus has served to accomplish the work of the Father and achieve the goal of the Father by becoming our Savior. In this way, Jesus has, attend, Jesus has attended the will of the Father to save the human race. There is no other person who has or whoever, uh, or whoever will be can claim to have seen and attended to the Father in this way. No one else can say that. All human beings who have encountered God have encountered Him while tainted with selfishness. But only Jesus, only Jesus has encountered God and revealed God in a completely selfless way. Completely selfless. Jesus, being totally selfless, can see and attend to God's will as no other human being ever has or ever will. In this sense, Jesus says, no one has seen God at any time, but he who is from God, he has seen him and he has attended to him. Because only the pure self Selflessness of Jesus can reveal the pure selflessness of God. You with me? And so now we are seeing God. We are seeing God for the first time. It says, no one has ever seen God before, but now we are seeing Him in Jesus Christ. Jesus says, basically, unless you sit down and you eat my flesh and you drink my blood, and I'm summarizing the last portion of this for time's sake, unless you sit down and partake of the bread of life, you have no life in you. You have nothing in you. And the disciples are like, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. We got the 28 fundamental beliefs. We've been having this for three or four generations. We got this all figured out. I'm on target. And you're saying, you're saying that I actually have to spend time with you every day on a consistent basis, that I have to abide in you like abiding in a vine, that I have to enter into this experience with you to be saved? This is a hard saying. And they tried to say, oh, this is cannibalism. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. They feigned ignorance, but they knew exactly what Jesus was saying. It's not good enough to have all of your pedigree, all of your background, all of your profession, all of your knowledge. You need to sit at my feet like Mary does. And they said, can't do it. And they walked no more with them. Verse 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with them. The word of God, friends, is the dividing line between the beast and the mark of the beast and following Jesus and following God. The dividing line is the word of God. And partaking of that word on a regular basis, letting it be your life, your flesh, your drink, your meat. Jesus turns to his disciples. Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Time and Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Where, where are we going to go? There's nothing that I can comment on this verse to make it any more meaningful than it already is. To whom shall we go? This is the experience that God wants to give each one of us so that we would come in contact with Jesus in such a way that when we look at this world and we look at the things of this world, when we look at all the temptations of this world, we would simply say, 
Where will we go but to be with Jesus? Nothing is more important than that. Let's pray. Father, what an amazing God you are. What an incredible God you are. I thank you so much that you, your will is that none should be lost. I thank you so much that, that you came not to condemn, but you came to save. You came to redeem, to restore, to make right, to fix our brokenness. Your word tells us that you are calling all, you are drawing all, you, are, you, you have put that in us. Father, help us to sit at your feet. 